saying whether or not you should buy it, and uh, a critique is more uh, what you got out of the experience and uh, an original way of thinking about it. I, I think, uh, for me, critique is always more about does the game succeed at what it's trying to do, which is utterly irrelevant to whether or not you might actually enjoy it. Uh, and so it's more about the form of the game, is it successful, and how does it relate to the rest of the art form, as opposed to just, is it worth your something bucks? I would say that uh, with aggregators, Metacritic, Tetris, and so many people are doing this, people who write reviews are going to have to do better and better things, do more criticism, and just sort of find some interesting take on it, because the number they give it is just going to move into something. When I want to know if the game's any good, I honestly do just go to Metacritic and see what's above, whatever. So <laughs> the pressure's on writers to suddenly be interesting for their own sake, even if they're doing a consumer, consumer product. The best way that I've come up to think of the difference between them is that a product review is what you would want to read before you play the game, yeah. and criticism is what you would want to read after you play the game. Uh, so I, you know, I think there is a difference, and I think they both have their place. I think that uh, a review is sort of a holistic but not terribly penetrating of the game, sure. whereas criticism might focus really intently on one small part of the game. Uh, and it may not make much sense to you unless you have it. You know, it may be what you look at when you want to have a conversation about the game, you just look at okay. So you just need a big spoiler alert in front of anything. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like we agree that there is a difference between reviews and criticism. So do we need some kind of formal delineation between them such that the reader's expectations are set accordingly? And again, the benchmark I use is Kirk Hamilton's review of Ali Noir and his label review. But again, I don't think he cares whether we're buying the game. I think part of the problem with that question is that you're putting a lot of the a lot of the onus on the reader to give a damn about terminology. You know, uh, it, it makes sense for us as writers to differentiate between review work. You know, my intent is to give you a review. My intent is to give you a critique. Uh, but readers don't so much differentiate between review, preview, feature, critique. You know, it's it's I'm reading about a game, and at the end, I'm either going to know something about it or not. You know, so I, I, I'm not sure that's entirely a realistic question. Like, we're used to dealing with gaming communities who obsess over this stuff. They know everything before it comes out, they're on gaming sites every day. The greater gaming population isn't like that. They are getting their advice from a guy at Best Buy. <laughs> so, I'm not sure, well, I think for, it is helpful to have them separate, it, just so the writer's intent is clear, I'm not sure the reader will really rock it all the time. Don't, don't you think that it's a reader's job to know what they're reading, though? I, I can't imagine who went to kill screen to read an L.A. Bar review. It's like, you didn't talk about the graphics. You know, that's not well, true. what kill screen does. And, you know, if you have ever read it before, you would know that you, you were getting what you wanted. If you wanted to know, you know, is this a good game, does it work, and, and what it's yeah. setting out to do, you know, there's places to go over that, too. And right. Isn't that your responsibility? I don't think the average gamer, the, the average person who buys games is reading kill screen. Because they don't. Well, they, yeah, they don't. Yeah, they yeah, don't yeah, that is not a slight against Kill Screen. So, so exactly. different I agree. But I think even if there were barriers, the, the writers should subvert them. I mean, it was it was tough because the L.A. War, L.A. War review did have a review score, say. and it was called a review. But that's just too bad. Like he could do whatever he wants because it's his space. And I think you know, if people look at it and they're like, "This is what I expected," then maybe they got less of a surprise, or maybe they just go and click away to the next thing. It's, it's funny. The reader expectations are kind of important. I remember. Um, when I used to be writing for Game Critics, I did a review of uh, Space Channel 5 Part 2. And it's it's a lot uh, mechanically the same as the first game. So I said, uh, you know, this is like the first game. And I spent the whole rest of the review talking about um, how Ulala was a horrible journalist and uh, put her own opinions into everything. It was kind of tongue in cheek how, you know, her dancing was actually showed her lack of objectivity. And the readers were, were kind of mad about this. They like, dude, I know nothing about this game now. I read this. And Game Critics is an outlet where, you know, it's, it's usually more thoughtful critique, but they still wanted to know, is this a game I should buy? Uh, that's kind of what they were coming for. It had a score at the end, and it had, you know, a comparison to the first game, but uh, they expected something different. In context for the question, <clears throat> maybe a slow your last name, but Abby Heavy. Anyone want to connect with those? That's correct. Okay. Um, when she wrote her review of Metroid Other M, uh, she had some kind of feminist criticism in the review. And I think a lot of the ire that she received uh, as a result of writing that was not only uh, because of the kind of tenor, uh, you know, the fact that the criticism was feminist, but the fact that it was there at all. That a lot of the comments were, why are you talking about this? Just tell me if the game's any good. Just does Samus turn into a ball? That was you know, her. That was what kind of stuff does she go back and find later? I don't really give a damn about any of this feminist crap. There's a lot of commentary, and that's where, that was one of the reasons why I thought about having this 
should there be a formal delineation so that a reader doesn't say, oh, well, this should have been here because I knew it was supposed to be here because this is Chris's review. That review was for IGN, I think I was G4. G4? Okay, well, there you go. We're not here to protect people from ideas. Sometimes you're going to get ideas, sometimes you're going to disagree with them. But I, I, Sorry, think, I, I just think when people go to G4 and they are expecting that kind of, you know, does she roll into a ball of review? Yeah, no, I mean, that kind of force that into G4 is, it's, it's audible, but it, the audience is going to say, hey. They, they have so, a house style, but it's like, you know, maybe those house styles need to be shaped up sometimes. That'd be great, but it's going to be an uphill battle. I don't, I'm not sure I necessarily agree that it should be shaken up sometimes. I mean, you are there to serve your reader, you know? Your audience is important, and what they want is important, not what we think they want or what we want them to want. Sure, but she identified a chief flaw in the game, which sure. a lot of people would respond to as, like, disqualifying the game from being any good. Not right. that's going to G4. Well, that's... <laughs> I also... So that's how you, 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 have different, you have different outlooks rather than different sections yeah. of the same outlook. Although I was, in, in my opinion, the majority of the I don't care was simply because it was feminist criticism. Because, you know, oh my god, stop it, feminism, yeah. It's just been yeah, a long time. Um, the thing is, I, I would love it if we got to do the review, and it was just a, here's what it's like to play the game. Boom. And for people who just want to know what it's like to play the game, there you go. And you're all happy. And then we also have the luxury of doing a critique for that same game. Here's why it succeeds or fails. Here's why it's important or it's not. Um, not every uh, uh, publication has that luxury, which is unfortunate because for me that would be fantastic because that serves everybody, that does everybody the most good, and also gives the writer, writers the most freedom to extend themselves and to push themselves and to try to break the rules that we tend to get forced into by the machine. So you're saying that that bifurcation does exist, it's just unannounced or, I mean, it's unannounced and contextual, and it's up to the reader to know which they're reading when they go to Alibi versus Alibi. I think they're I think they're pretty smart about that. They usually figure it out. I also think economically, you know, it makes sense to, to find a niche if you're going to focus on critiques or focus on reviews. I mean, it would be nice if you could do both, like you said, but uh, being that broad, you're just kind of, kind of, unless you have a huge staff, it's going to be kind of jack of all trades, uh, master of none situation. It's better off if you, you pick one or the other, usually know your audience. I still think, though, I mean, it is interesting with how stuff people expect what they expect. I mean, Kotaku, I mean, I'm sure probably a lot of people never read Kotaku. Wow, okay, yeah. Um, over the last year, no, no, listen. No, I, I used to kind of make fun of Kotaku. Like, oh, they're just pumping out posts every hour. It's like they don't really care or whatever. I know they work hard, but it's like whatever. Uh, commodity. And they, you know, and that was already easy to do. And they have been killing it over the last year. And really, under Jason Johnson, Steve Tatillo, and the writers that bring in like Hamilton and like a lot of others, are doing really bold stuff and writing about stuff that's more about the culture and fans and what gamers think and different kinds of gamers and different kinds of games. And really pushing the envelope on that. And it's wonderful. And also with their views, because they don't get scores right. I mean, they're, they're a certain amount and they don't want to play with Metacritic. Um, they're doing wonderful stuff and they're pushing people, a lot of people reacted really negatively. But I think even the people who were disappointed or walked away in a rage still got something out of it that they wouldn't have if it was just, oh, it's the same thing again today. Um, we all have our comfort zones, we all have our expectations, but I, I mean, and maybe it won't even work out in the long run, but just God bless them that they did that, you know? And I think everyone comes out richer even if they don't know it first. Uh, yeah, they, they have a lot, but I wonder if, if everyone could be, has that luxury for top which is one of the biggest sites out there. People mm -hmm. uh, kind of tend to rely on them, they can push their own path. Well, they also want new readers, that's yeah. a priority. And so, like, when you reach out to people who maybe aren't necessarily gamers, that's actually pretty shrewd as well as noble. I think they probably gained more than they lost. Uh, to yeah. A lot of people probably stuck around and did the press. Yeah, but like IGN, I mean, if you look at the IGN media kit, it's all about bros, we reach bros, we know how to sell bros. So it's like there's higher economic... He's not models. exaggerating, he does actually yeah, say that, bros. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an actual... And, and so, you know, they don't have that luxury, but under Nick Denton, oddly, they do. So, I mean, I think that actually speaks to what you're saying, Kyle, about G4 and having kind of uh, people having expectations. That's a pretty big outlet, too. So, do they actually have the latitude to kind of question people's expectations and grow into different styles? Uh, they, they're in an odd position because they're associated with a kind of lowest common denominator cable network, too, that shows uh, reruns of cops and, and all that thing. So, um, unless they're willing to really split the web presence for, away from that, uh, you're always going to be tied to uh, attacking the show and uh, people watching something like that 
they're really not going to want a deeper criticism for the most part. I think our next panel might be what's wrong with cops. If you can, if you can, if you can sneak that by one. All right. Does the nature of an individual game limit the kind of discussion it supports? Should a reader look at a certain title and expect a review or expect a criticism? Yeah, I think a reader is not going to know unless they played the game. Probably, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it definitely seems as though a different game will lend itself to a different kind of writing. We've seen that with Journey. Everybody sort of wrote diary style. Like this is how my journey went. This is how it made me feel. And if they did mention anything about mechanics or anything, sort of in passing, because that wasn't the purpose of the game. If you were reviewing a puzzle game, you would definitely not say, "I felt really, per I felt something profound when I cleared that row of blocks." You, you could do it; you would probably not do it very well. Um, so, yeah, I, I think so. But I think that if you're a reader, unless you have a lot of advanced knowledge, you're, you're not going to know necessarily what you want to get out of the review, unless you know what the style is. Not really a game; it's never about where you're moving. So, I want to ask if anybody's ever had a profound experience by clearing a row of blocks. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Intelligent people. Please step up to the mic. We're yeah. asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get into it. It wasn't a life-changing moment when you got your first Tetris. Okay? <laughs> Blocks coming towards you, and it, when they crush you, it comes out. And then, if, if you you actually lose your fitting and fall into the void, so you know it's it's a really simple game mechanically, but there's a little bit more there. So you, it, I don't think you can bifurcate it to that easily. Where it's oh, this is a simple game with just a review. This is a really complex game. But it needs a, a great critique. I, I do think though it's much easier with something like Journey or with like Passage and these kind of games. It's so easy to get ideas. And there's actually a specific problem, and some people are addressing like Hookshot, but it's hard to write about. We know there are a ton of important dollar games. I mean, like, I love playing Ziggurat. I don't know if I could write more than 50 words about it. And I don't want to overwrite and try to paint it as some huge thing, which it's clearly not. But it does have a really good mechanic that's worth talking about. Um, that's a problem I haven't really seen people solve well. Yeah. Or something that's that's more about the style or the genre, like a schmuck. Yeah, to talk about it. You know, you either know it or you are not interested in it at all. Really. Exactly. Like, you know, you're not going to win new people over to treasure. You know, but I, I feel like a good critique maybe could win, win new people over. You, you explain to them what makes this schmuck so interesting to you in a way that even if, they're, even if they don't understand it personally, you get through to them how it made you feel, why you got into it, and then they they learn something. But don't you think that would be more about, in the case, in the case specifically of schmucks, would be more about the genre? Like what I get out of this thing that is punishingly difficult is a sense of victory and the and you kind of as opposed to like a Garuga in particular. Well, you kind of use the game as a jumping off point, maybe to discuss the wider genre. I know Tom Missile does that a lot. His reviews, he'll start off talking about one game, and he'll mention you know two or three others in, a, in an extended page long digression, and then he comes back. I, I also sometimes, I mean, schmucks might be a little harder because the mechanic really kind of isn't that interesting to talk to, but like there are some games like I don't know much about strategy games. And I was looking at quarter to three, Bruce Garrett recently wrote a review of 40 Acres of Snow. And it was utterly fascinating to me, and it was really well written. It really explained. I think he also kind of knew that, like, not everyone in the world had played or known about this game, and so he reached out, and it was a great review. And so you can't. I, I, I don't think a schmuck would get that. Wait, was, was it a great review or no, was it a great piece of writing? Two different things. Piece. I think it was. I think it was a. Review. I think both. I, yeah, because he reviewed the game very well and did write by it, but he also explained it to me and got me interested in it, okay. and I knew nothing. So. Then, then yeah, that's a successful review. But well, whereas I can go like I, you know I read a lot of music criticism to like dance music criticism is like oh my god I mean it's just like purely about like oh it's a sort of house techno group it's got this BPM blah 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 it's like from Berlin and it's like completely people speaking to each other kind of like what you were saying so I don't read that is that dubstep criticism <laughs> yeah yeah so the criticism is where's the bass drop <laughs> a little too much blah 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 in that one does everybody know what a shop is. Shoot him up. Yeah, that's you know what one is. You are my people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a shoot him up. Shoot him up. Space shooter. Yeah. 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 Shoot him up. Our type. That's one of the yeah. Best one of all time is Rainy Soldier. Just put that out there. So, shoot is a well, shoot him up. Herodius. So, like, uh. Herodius, yes. Herodius, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. what's the name of the How are they pronouncing it? Probably just slightly yeah. better. A good piece of criticism. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, yeah. we got We got this. Yeah. I don't like shmups myself because I get really upset fast when games aren't easy. And, uh, <laughs> but I, if I've read it, I didn't, I've read that piece, but I want to. Like, I think 
good piece of criticism is something that makes you appreciate something, even if it doesn't convince you to like it. Now, there's, there's a lot of genres that aren't for me, but I've definitely read things about head-to-head -head fighting games or strategy games where I say, you know, this person is understanding this on a different level, and I have an appreciation for it now, even if I'm not going to go out and buy the game, because I still know that after an hour, I'm say, you know, I'm not smart enough to play this game, so I may just have to accept it. Yeah, it's like, I know it's not for me, but now I understand why it's for you. Yeah. 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 After you read a really good piece, that's what you can get. Is it acceptable for a video game review to not acknowledge video games as product at all? Yes. Sure. <laughs> where, where, where are you coming from on that? Well, okay, so we just said that there's a difference between a review and criticism, that a review is tailored to a certain audience, and it's an audience that wants to know how the game works and whether or not they should buy it. So if something is labeled as a review, does that suggest that it's automatically, that its default setting is treating a video game as a product, and that that's the final kind of calculation of its assessments? So do we have to talk about price and stuff here, or? Just the concept. Just at all, I mean, the concept generally. That you have to buy it or not. Yeah. Right? So. I mean, I feel like most reviews speak to the whole $60 price range. Is it worth, even if it's not stated as such, is it worth your 60 bucks? See, that's, that's Unless not it's a review, review at all. Uh, my approach, and although I do consider reviews to be consumer focused, is not should you buy this. It's let me tell you what this is like to play. And then you, based on whatever criteria suits you, make your decision about whether or not you buy it, what price you buy it at, whether you rent it, whether you get it used, whatever. That's, that's you, and only you know that criteria for yourself. So I'm just going to try and share it with you. Here is what the experience you will probably have is. Go. And that's not true. I mean, that's not speaking to is this problem. What if you're a genre expert? Like, this may be one of the most arrogant things I say at a mic for the next couple of years, but uh, I, you know, I know a lot about first person shooters, and I feel extremely confident looking at an FPS and telling another FPS fan, you should or shouldn't buy this. You have no idea what my personal taste in handguns are. But there are certain things that we just don't like in first person shooters. What if. Uh, uh, guns that aren't very balanced, or there's a lack of variety in weapons, or there's not enough ammo, or the AI, they're just stupid, like they're not difficult to get. So, you know, I think there are always certain kind of baseline considerations for different genres. So if you're somebody who has a lot of experience with that genre, you don't think a reviewer could actually say, I would not buy this? Because one of the things that no, we no, no. Because what will, okay, every single one of us has a game, or several games out there, that we know is mechanically flawed that just taken on a strict objective look is, it's broken this way, this way, this way, this way. But this other thing I get out of it is enough to make me not care about any of this column. And for every person, that whatever this is, is different. So it might be the setting, it might be the music, it might be the characterization, it might be that it lets you craft, I don't know, whatever. Everybody has their thing that lets them forgive sins. So, so Susan, is what you're saying that you should just describe what the game is like and not give your opinion on what things were good or bad? Well, and obviously, I mean, a review is based on opinion, and I can tell you whether I think something works or not. You know, uh, just a journey is the, the current uh, example, but, you know, I can tell you that I had a very emotional experience with it. And I can tell you, like, okay, yes, it has mechanics, but the mechanics are kind of incidental to the experience you are going to have. It is going to move you in a very personal way. And I can't tell you what that's going to be like, but I can tell you that it will affect your emotion. You were just saying, you know, you don't know my angles, you don't know what I'm like. You can really only describe what you have. I'm, I'm not sure that you can actually say you are going to have this experience. Your experience is, is going to be different. I didn't say that you were going to have the same experience I did, but that you were going to have that experience. I can't, I literally cannot imagine someone playing Journey and come, coming away from it completely. I do think when you mention the mechanics, I do think people can, and Jason Killingsworth just did this in Journey, like focus on the mechanics and explain how that would create sure. a awesome. Yeah, Which yeah, is actually sure. something that I, I don't see enough of. There are no, like there are a lot of people who will talk about the mechanics, like, oh yeah, the game plays awesome, the guns are cool, whatever. And then there'll be people like, um, in the more kind of brainy sphere, cultural kind of we want games to be our sphere, who are more like really into like a story, but it's almost like they're reviewing it like a film and not like a game. And there's I, I see a big divide between those two. There aren't a lot of people both and say, I made really good beats on these mechanics and kind of almost the industrial design of this game, and I'm connected to this is the meaning that is then expressed and why it's a piece of culture because it has an awesome jump mechanic. And Jason Killingsworth did just do this, but I don't see it very often. I, I've read that as well and thought he did, I don't know, a thousand plus words just about the jumping in Journey. And I actually thought that I learned more about Journey from that than from any of the other reviews that I read that used the word transcendent over and over. He, he explained the game in a way that was pertinent to me, yeah, that didn't rely on, on how I felt or, or in, in, 
in me empathizing with what he said, he felt like the game did that. He was kind of looking at it on a more concrete level. I thought that was a great piece of criticism. Didn't really read like a review, but did have some of the same aims. So I don't think this is what you meant, Susan, but it brought up this question. So when we're writing a review of a game, we're talking about its mechanics and how it functions. It's kind of this is these are the this is the input you're going to receive, which will inspire whatever experience you're having. That sounds something like bias neutrality, something like I am going to, you know, I am the expert, I have the words, the thing to describe this experience to you without you having a controller in your hand, which kind of begs the question for me, is there such a thing as bias neutrality in review? Because I think this is something that not all fans, but a lot of fans ask for, that they just want a neutral or unbiased review. Is that even possible? That would be the question for everybody. There's a lot of feigned neutrality. There's a lot of pretend neutrality. I don't think there is any real expand on uh, I mean, I think like, we, we all do have our own objectives and our own, uh, you know, from what we want out of a game, we all have our own biases, we all have our own baggage that we bring to a game. And, you know, your review shouldn't be about you, it should be about the game, but, you know, it should be clear that you, your, your opinion is based on certain facts and, and why, you know, why does something resonate with you and not with somebody else? And, you know, what you're saying about, what you said actually, Susan, about frozen games that we love, I mean, I've been playing an awful lot of Syndicate, and I know it's not that good. If I was telling anybody about it, I would tell them all the reasons why it's not good, but I can't stop playing. And that's that's where I would have to do a better job than I can do right at this moment telling you why, because there is some sort of, like, some magic involved between the controller and the game. I guess I'm not even really sure what it is. Yeah. I feel like if you really want an objective review of a game, it, uh, it used to come in the package. It was called the instruction booklet. <laughs> it would tell you the story, it tells you A jumps, and then B shoots, and uh, you got no opinion about what it, this was, you know, what the game is. Uh, you've already bought the game at that point, so I guess it's not that useful. But uh, a, a truly objective review would be incredibly boring to read, just like an instruction booklet is, you know, kind of utilitarian and not really useful for uh, getting an opinion. Yeah, how would you like? Oh, these design decisions were good, or they were bad. Um, you know, writers should be able to write with authority, and the reader knows that they can disagree with what they're reading or take another opinion. I mean, there is an objective. That's as objective as you can get because it's the widest sampling of people responding to something. Um, you know, I mean, you can disagree with it, but something that got a 50 is because you're certainly not as good as something in the 90s. And, you know, but writers, I mean, there was actually Simon Park and Dave on Charter 3 and 8, and people were that shit. And you know what? It, you don't have to agree with them. It's not there to affirm your opinions. He gave that opinion, and he gave that review, and it's, I don't think he was even saying it's the most, he wasn't thinking of it in terms of Objective. He's just like, I'm, I have authority, I'm turning out this work product and this assessment of this game, and this is what it is. That's the best you can do. Every single person in this room is biased. Every single person at this table is biased. We are all biased. If you have an opinion that you cannot, you know, defend with old hard fact, then you're biased. That is not a flaw. It means you're human, that has emotions. So, obviously, we as reviewers, we, like, like I said, we all bring our own baggage to things. Uh, so that's why what is generally going to be the most helpful for a reader is to read a reviewer's work over a period of time to learn their collections and their biases. Like, everybody who reads my work knows that I love weird shit. And I love story-based games. So, you know, if something, if something combines those two things, I'm going to freak out. If you don't like one or other of those things, you are not going to have the same reaction. And you can kind of tailor your, your uh, acceptance of a particular person's review once you understand what works. Chris, to speak to your point about reviews that uh, kind of focus on the mechanics and assessments of the mechanics, how they, how they work, whether or not they work, um, do you think a reason why we don't have more of that content being produced is it just because we have, is it because we don't have a lot of practice doing it as writers, or is it because the audience doesn't have a lot of practice reading that material such that no one thinks the audience is there? Uh, I think I think we, we've talked about how maybe we feel there's the market, so we tailor things for that, but I think the readers can do it. I think it's I think it's something that just hasn't been successfully done as much. I think you have a lot of people that are really focusing on either, either the one or the other on just like, oh this is a really good FPS, it's good gameplay, or being like I'm making some big cultural statement and not as much being able to connect the two. And if you look at other disciplines like classical music, um, some of that's impenetrable, but like there's a guy Alex Ross who writes in New Yorker. And he's a marvelous critic. And he'll go to a concert and read the score along with it, you know, and understand exactly what you're doing, the choices you made. But then he goes home and turns into a piece that someone like me who doesn't read sheet music can totally enjoy. 
And that's a beautiful thing. You can talk about the theory and about specific really mechanical things, but explain why that makes this this unbelievably beautiful piece of music. And again, I don't think that, I think that it's in our power, and I think we could do that, and I just think that we just aren't yet. And I don't know why. Um, I think this is really hard, and I think maybe game critics don't always know how to answer that well. Maybe there's a million other factors, but it's just not something, something maybe something we're pushing to, and maybe something that we should do more. It's very hard, and uh, you know, from a practical standpoint, I think uh, if you're an editor looking at the economics of this, uh, you, you could hire, you know, one superstar who knows all these things and is going to command a high rate, or you could hire, you know, the, some 16-year-old uh, kid to crank out the kind of reviews that are from IGN and GameSpot, where they can review every game and just really give you, you know, the straight mechanics. And uh, on the web, well, one of those is probably going to make uh, a lot more money than the other. So it's uh, it, it's hard when that audience is improving up there to really take that risk and you know, go for that uh, broader uh, culture of criticism. Do you think it's, so here's a question that might get me lynched by my panelists and colleagues, and then I'll have a question that might get me lynched by you guys. Um, do you think it's the responsibility of the games press to learn more about how video games are made, to open up those avenues of conversation? And let me just give an example. So um, I was going to write something about Skyrim, and how the hell could this game be a game of the year because it doesn't work, right? So many bugs, so many things were wrong, and then I went to GDC this year, and I spent more time talking to developers. What I realized was that there was so much going on under the hood of Skyrim that was so difficult to pull off that, you know, I mean, when the, uh, like at DICE, the one awards at DICE, they award one award at GDC. And the reason why I really won those awards was because there were mechanical things taking place under the hood that were so difficult to pull off that that kind of science of construction overrode the books, and maybe that was something I hadn't thought about because I was only looking at it from the perspective of a consumer who was having difficulty with, you know, certain piddly parts of the game. I mean, I got lucky. I didn't see, like, dragons flying backwards or, like, dead people coming to life and running around towns later, which actually happened to my wife. Um, <laughs> so, you know, is it the responsibility of the game express to learn more about how games are made to either be able to speak to criticisms or to tailor or to maybe mitigate our reactions to different problems, and to be able to expand the way we write about games? Um, I think that, I think you can always learn more. And I think we, and first of all, need to know our limitations. I mean, my one pet peeve, not everyone does this, but when someone writes a review, they're like, why didn't they do this? And it's like, there's probably an awfully good reason they didn't, but, um, but you don't know. And you might, you weren't there when they play tested it and it stank or it cost a billion dollars to do. Um, the industry certainly doesn't make it easy, though. I mean, I think there are a lot of ways, and I would recommend the Anna Antwerpy's book, Rise of the Game Games Game Service. It's a wonderful read, and it's very, very good if you've ever been curious about making a game and you just need someone to kind of give you a push, show you some tools, and tell you to get off your ass. It's an excellent book. Um, the, the, we could, it's in our power to make games, even pen and paper games. We can all do it, and we can learn a lot from that. But the industry doesn't make it easy. It's not like you could go to a AAA studio and they'll explain what went wrong or what they were doing or how anything works. Uh, you know, we go to these press appointments at like GDC or E3 where like you end up looking at a game and you're sitting with a publicist and you don't get to hold the controller. So it's like, no, you're not going to be able to ask them about how the physics engine works for them. So, you know, we could get more help from that. In a sense, though, I mean, isn't, it would be good to probably know more about game development. I don't know very much, but in a sense, it's also you know, kind of too bad if, if, this, if they wanted to make it better and they didn't. That's true of every single game that you've ever played. They were all, they were all supposed to be. Were all supposed to work. Yeah. Most of them didn't do what they were supposed to do. Most of them didn't work. I mean, in the case of Skyrim, it's a game that obviously doesn't have a lot of flaws, and yet they also managed to achieve a whole lot that a lot of other people didn't achieve, too. So, you know, like, if, how is it helpful in our view to say, you know, if only they had been able to not have this sound effect? But like, maybe a bug is, is kind of a, in Skyrim, maybe a bug that you don't want is something that only happens to you, and it actually gives you a unique experience that nobody else had playing the game. I'd say that it can be helpful to know in, in general how games are made and just that uh, you know the limitations of, of games better and you know uh, what way to play better. But uh, I don't think you can use that as an excuse uh, for things like Skyrim. Like, oh, they worked really hard and they did a lot of stuff, but if those bugs make the game unplayable for you, all that work matters is the final product. Uh, you can't just go back and say, well, it happened because of this, so come on, give them a break. Uh, I don't think many people would do that. I think it's very helpful when uh, when you're engaging with your community. Um, the, for me, the process of review is an ongoing dialogue with the readers. And the more
more I know about the overall uh, development process and then uh, the machinery that makes a game, when they bring up complaints like, how could you possibly play this game of the year when it has so many bugs? Well, I can tell you that. And let's have a dialogue about that. And you can either then, as a reader, decide that you think I'm doing crap. Or you can say, oh, okay, I see where you're coming from, and I can add that perspective to my overall evaluation of how helpful this is for me. I chose just not to write that down. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so here's the question. So the first headline was, Dennis Semeca says game journalists don't know enough about how games are made. Um, so here's the, here's the second. If we're tailoring, I think it's the responsibility of the games press to kind of take responsibility in growing criticism. Um, I think in uh, film, you had, I'm probably going to mis mispronounce this, Cahiers de Cinema, which was a magazine which was filmmakers speaking to other filmmakers, and that led to an expansion of kind of the language and appreciation of film. Uh, we don't really have that in video games. We don't have any magazines where developers are talking to developers all the time. We do have the video game press. So I kind of see us as the custodians of the uh, kind of, you know, uh, growth of criticism. So do we have, do we think about the audience too much when we write our critiques and reviews, and are we potentially holding ourselves back uh, from not questioning paradigms or not questioning what we think one outlet or another ought to do? Do we have any responsibility to kind of expand our horizons and prep the audience for having those conversations in the future? Could you restate the question? <laughs>
don't really help anybody, just gin up page views aren't really valuable enough themselves. I mean, you, you obviously want an audience, but for me, like, that, the way I write is that I'm the audience and I don't, I hope that there are people like me out there, you know, I just write what I want to hear, and, and if there's not, that's okay. You know, I'm well, not going to write mean, something yeah. else that I don't believe in because I think somebody else wants to oh, read it. Oh, that's, yeah, that, that was the point. Yeah, yeah no. and the cosplay gallery is not writing, so let's just not even go there. What about looking door? Job. <laughs> but it, it can be tough though if it's your if it's your job and the audience is demanding something you know they want you to cover X game and you're like oh, I love the X game and there's really not uh, much there to it so it, you but you still have to write something about it and the audience is you know almost demanding that you know you like it if you don't you're going to piss them off it takes uh, real skill to manage those audience expectations sometimes and, uh, not uh, not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Dude, no, I, okay, I am uh, apparently uh, incredibly corrupt because I liked Uncharted 3 too much. How dare you? I know. And uh, Mass Effect, I don't know. So, it, you know, it's, when I say giving the audience what they want, I don't mean specifically like there's a cosplay gallery because you love boobs and stuff like that. <laughs> I think it's, you should experiment and give it, uh, you know, new ideas, new presentation, but not completely say, well, I don't feel like doing this kind of review anymore, so screw you if you don't like it. You know, that's not going to be helpful. And I think it's very important. Kyle keeps bringing up the economics of the situation. And yeah, we've got to keep the lights on. There are certain practical realities we have to deal with. I mean, it's, there's theory and idealized, you know, notions about how we should be talking about this stuff. But you got to have an audience. You've got to pay the bills. I do think though that and, and the pace and how you do it can differ and no one's figured it out yet, but you would clearly it's probably like people who love games love games and there's this average community of people that like in this building. And they love games and they understand games. And then everyone else in the world, there are a lot of people who don't. And um, you know, I follow the mainstream press a lot. Sometimes they really get right these marvelous profiles of game creators like, okay, so Joe Weiner on Dwarf Fortress last year in the New York Times magazine. Amazing piece, even if you don't like Dwarf Fortress, go read this piece. This Sunday, the New York Times magazine was a cover story about quote unquote stupid games. That was so bad, dude. It's such a bad. Oh my it's not a bad writer. I'm not trying to diss another writer, but like it was just this kind of really mean spirited, condescending thing where he's just like, Angry Birds and all these games, one dollar games, are kind of stupid. And then he interviews Zach Gage, who's amazing, but then just kind of just throws it in there. It's like, dude, you're lucky to talk to Zach Gage. And it's just like thoughtless. And um, but we know that it comes from the perspective that sometimes the New York Times magazine runs lifestyle things that they know their audience will relate to and be like, yeah, I kind of waste too much time playing Angry Birds too. Why do I do that? So bring all that up. There's this divide, right? Games are not part of the larger culture, really. They kind of maybe are leaking that way. People are getting interested. The iPhone is helping, but they're separate. And it's not like movies where you could have a movie about blue skinned aliens on this planet, and everyone will go see that. Games, you know, games are sort of torn. There may be sort of more, they're a little wider than maybe like comic books, which are definitely in their own ghetto right now, unfortunately. But they're not at the movie stage. And I think one of the things that we can do as game journalists is to help bridge that gap to bring all these people who also buy things, so advertising dollars or what's over, bring them in, and also help the gamers maybe be interested in things other than games, because sometimes they're not. But uh, that requires the audience to sort of come looking for it sometimes. If especially you tempt them, you lure them in, that's what we do, we hook them, and then it's sort of like, boy, I didn't know I cared about that, now all of a sudden I'm totally That's open. fine, and if you're writing for the New York Times, you can do that, you're at, you have the mainstream audience there. If you're writing for uh, you know, a site that already just caters directly to gamers, I'm not sure the New York Times readers are even going to know that's there without some you know, great PR team or something. Yeah, but I mean, I do think, I do think that, I mean, like, that, that they ran an article about Dwarf Fortress in the New York Times magazine. It blows my mind so wide open that it's sort of like, and there are people who walked away from that taking games more seriously, and the people who make them more seriously, even more friendly. Right, but if they wrote that piece uh, for Kotaku, do you think the New York Times magazine audience would suddenly start reading Kotaku? I think the Kotaku wants the New York Times magazine audience. But would they, would, would that audience? They will find ways to get it, and I think they're looking right now. Fair. Dude, I want the New York Times. <laughs> Who doesn't? Well, speaking of the audience which already cares about video games, uh, we want to leave some time for questions. I think we have two mics to pass around. Uh, can we get those? I hear they come from the back. One on the right, one on the left. I guess put your hands up. We have random person here. <laughs> <laughs> Just get everyone to line up like behind those like gray stripes there, just to make sure that we can uh, 
make things easier for the enforcers and they can walk the bikes in line. I mean, I'd love to see everybody fight over them. That's probably not very cool. That's a little bit of my um, So I hear a lot of talk about like developers should be more involved with the critics. And I kind of wanted to keep you get a feel for like, how do you feel about the developer critic hybrid as a person? Because I've seen some arguments that developers should be more involved because developers are talking about criticism because they have the sense of But I've also seen arguments that that's kind of incestuous and it kind of leads to a sort of weird bias on behalf of the developer that feels so. How do you feel about that? I think a critic who goes to work on a 2D and just self a total setup. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, you have to be ethical and honest, but, um, and I've curtailed a lot of my work, just to say because I'm working on a game, but, right. and maybe I was just saying I did this, but I've learned so much more from being exposed to the inner workings of this process than I knew beforehand. But I could have just been stupid, so I'm not saying everyone has to do that. You're not stupid, Chris. Yeah. So it's definitely a positive thing. Yeah, but I understand what you mean, that like people do get kind of, there are always fears of kind of journalists getting in bed with companies in different ways, either be it the junkets that they'll supply you somewhere and spend a lot of money on you, or any number of other ways, and you just have to, that's just something a professional journalism organization has to manage always. I guess it's kind of my blanket answer. So, I guess the question I have is, what do you, how do you feel about all the money that rides on what happens in the game industry right now? For example, when a bad movie review comes out, certainly that won't impact ticket sales. But that doesn't mean the team and the team really necessarily make much money in the final. I have a certain number of you know, friends in the industry that Metacritic reviews, if you don't make a certain percentage in Metacritic, that's a direct hit to your money. So the question, if anybody didn't hear it, was to what degree should we be concerned about the economic repercussions of our reviews? I, I don't think you can really worry about it too much. You're, you're not writing for the developers, you're writing for the readers that, that you have. And if, if you lose their trust by you know, worrying that uh, some people are going to be out of a job, uh, if you give a bad review, that, then you're going to be out of a job because uh, the readers aren't going to trust your opinion anymore. So, you know, as hard as it is painting a game sometimes, knowing that people put a lot of work into it, if, uh, if it's really not a bad game, you've got to say that. I hate that those agreements exist. I hate it. I really do. But that's not my problem, you know? Yeah. It's, that is between the folks making the game and the folks making that financial arrangement. I can't concern myself with that because then I lose all view of objectivity because if I begin to care about that for a moment, I'm gonna, think, I'm gonna say everything's awesome. So I don't want anybody to lose a bonus or lose their job because I think their game mechanics blow. You know, so it's not something we can think about and still do our jobs. If I could jump in on that, I don't think your question was actually about our reviews. I think your question was about Metacritic. Um, I think if you go through and you look at the way they translate uh, alphanumerics to numerics, I mean, what's a C in England? It's not the same as a C in the United States. Or if you have a star system, um, or you know, so some other non zero to 10 or zero to 100, you know, there's a lot of math going on behind those scores to determine what the meta score is. So I think really that's a question for, uh, I think we need to ask how Metacritic comes up with those scores, which then determines those bonuses, because it's not all us. Only there was some way. Yeah, at least someone was working on something right now. Just that yeah, that, that, that yeah. pen's already done. <laughs> <laughs> bring that up again. If you were there, you know what I mean. Um, if we can jump, I'll make sure we get Thank you. Okay, excellent, excellent question. So we're living in an increasingly multimedia world, and I see that I'm just remarking here, like not to you know limit your experience of what you do, but like writer, writer, editor, editor, writer, writer, writer. To what degree do you think could you look at criticism or reviews or any of those beyond just the written word and looking at podcast videos or anything to sort of give that you know difference between? Could you say like, critique is for this sort of long piece written thing, and then a review or you know my opinion? of whether you should buy this game is going to come out when I talk about it on Twitter or on the podcast. Um, I, I think uh, Abby Happy's review of uh, Metroid Overhead was a video, wasn't it? 
he gets pointed to uh, a lot. Uh, first of all, he does not consider himself a reviewer. Okay? He calls himself a critic. And his videos are very, very funny and they're very profane and they throw lots of insults and all of that. But what a lot of people miss is that under all of that, there was really sound uh, observation and insight about what makes games work and what doesn't. And if that wasn't there, none of the rest would be entertaining or informative. He wouldn't still be on the internet because people would have gotten bored and given up long ago. So humor just as filler doesn't really achieve anything. I think if it's humor when it works adds a lot, but it has it has to work. If you're trying to be funny, you're probably not being funny. People who are funny are that way naturally. I also say, you know, not just because they pay the rent, but Penny Arcade uses humor in games really well. And the reason is that I find often when they do a comic strip about a game, they really nail some piece of the game that's important and say something perceptive when they tell the joke. And so they're using humor well. I also like that they don't have like eight punchlines crammed into the last panel. They're not like, oh, and I hate the jump too. You know, it's like they just make their point. That's a good use of it. Yep. I want to take another one from uh, Twitter, but I want to read this first. IGN would rate this panel a 9.5, but I don't know what that actually means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, someone asks, because games draw on so many elements, music, art, voicing, mechanics, etc., do good critics need to be experts at all parts? You may think the answer is a blanket no for experts, but it raises an interesting question. To what degree do we need to be able to address the score? Art design, like you know, limbo is kind of a. Uh, you know, I, I'm expanding on somebody else's question, but I have room. But you know, uh, limbo is, has you know, some German expressionism in there. Maybe if you understand German expressionism, you can speak to a certain quality of limbo that you otherwise might not. But anyway, it can't hurt. But uh, I don't think it's it's necessary to know everything about every element of every game to be able to say something about every game. You bring, you bring your knowledge into it, and hopefully you share that knowledge through your writing. Uh, the more knowledge you have, the more you can share, but, uh, but that doesn't mean you have to be uh, an expert in every video game ever made or every work of art ever made, because no one is. Well, the player's not going to be an expert on all those things. So, I mean, I think if you are an expert uh, on any one of those particular areas, then it, you might get more out of the experience, but the broad audience is not going to be an expert. Um, so I don't know if this is awesome, but... I'm an expert on German. You're not an expert. What do you do? I'm an expert on German. Yes, I'm an expert on German. I think the key is just don't, don't pretend you're an expert on something that you're not. Yeah. And know when you're not. That's good advice. So if you're, like, Michael Adams is an amazing... Uh, he's, he's a the chair of the drama department at Wabash College, and he writes an amazing blog for anygamer.com. He knows acting. So when he talks about voice acting, that's awesome. But if you don't really know it, and you're just like, oh, I don't know it, then that's not really valid. Uh, question for you. Yeah, I have been, what's it called, as an independent game developer, it's not very easy to get criticism on my game. But whenever I did find, find myself finding this criticism, it was sounding negative. And I was wondering about your opinion on whether this is like, what's it called, the review system influencing the people who are playtesting and the actual players nowadays. So they give you a bit of context on what I mean by this. Um, it's there been a dramatic shift between the, uh, what's it called, people who are reading reviews on the actual um, IGNs and, you know, major uh, publications of the world to, you know, the player um, introduced criticisms of, you know, angry video game nerd and the other people, uh, what's it called, who just go online with a YouTube account and rant and rave about how much they hate things to make it entertainment. And the idea that entertainment, um, what's it called, not only should my game be entertainment, but the review should be entertainment. And if I'm not entertained, I'm angry. And I get to express this to the people who are now, it's not getting back to the developers, the people who have to make these things for them. So and since this is actually becoming like really, pro, uh, sorry about being long-winded, being really wide and broad for who's being receiving all this information, um, is it that are the reviewers taking responsibility for how it's starting to affect the developer as trying to create something that's positive whenever they are only receiving the negative as an entertainment? Here's the thing. There's 
there is constructive criticism, this doesn't work because. Yeah. And there's, you suck. The developer needs to know which to listen to. If someone just says, dude, your game blows, ignore him. That's not helpful in any way. And that's just them whining because you didn't give them whatever. If, however, they are addressing specific things, like the pacing is off, the graphics are bad, the controls are bad, that's something you need to listen to because that's fair. I think what you might be asking about, though, is how you know this kind of snarky attitude is kind of infected large parts of the game journalism sure, yeah. world, and you know it's hard for anything positive to really even get readership because uh, you know oh if you like the game that's a boring review, but if you're, you're snarking on a game oh that's fun you get to see a takedown. Yeah. So I, I can see it a little bit to that actually. I don't know what the solution is, but yeah, but I mean just because it's snarky doesn't necessarily mean it's not accurate. <laughs> no, that's true, but I think a lot of places uh, right. That tend to be snarky just because they know it works. I agree. I would people, agree, yes. uh, people really respond to that snark, even yeah. if even if it's something that they like, it, it yeah. gets the reviews. I agree. But isn't our scale like nothing gets below seven unless it's a movie tie-in game, basically? Yes. Yeah, we're more generous. If you look at Metacritic's yeah. analysis scores, they're all in the toilet. Like movies you'd actually go see again at like sixty, and they're terrible. And so yeah. I think like we have to be maybe more mature, but also maybe more true. Maybe the scale should shift down a little. So the things that get in the eighties really stand out. How do you draw the difference between what belongs in a review and what belongs in a criticism? Like, where do you draw, draw the line between something that makes the game worth buying, what opens it up for discussion, or what's just pointless nitpicking? Just for the record, we're going to make that our last one, so make it good, guys. Uh, you know, one person's nitpicking is another person's plot. Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I think there's not, you're not going to be allowed to be a you're not going to be a lot of time for a review. Um, but I think that, you know, any review is going to prioritize a different work in the game over another one. I just want to say, you know, you should read multiple reviews of a game if you want to get a lot of time for it. Or you should read a writer who's working on it and you know, that's what they're going to do. And whether they are not thinking about whether they, they really are on something or not. So I always complain about that. I feel like most of the time when a review gets controversial, it's, it's because of this very issue. Because uh, things the reviewer thinks are totally forgivable or totally unforgivable, a lot of the readers think the opposite. So, it's, uh, it's kind of a good example. You know, there's all these bugs, and uh, some reviewers might say that these bugs became unplayable, or, or some uh, players think, whereas uh, the other side would say, but look at all these, these grand things. You fight the dragons, and these great experiences. You, you can ignore them. So, the relative value of all those things is, is that. It's totally relative. You're, you're never going to get total agreement on that. I figure, you know, you, if, if you have a writer who's just obsessing about weird stuff or sort of off or any off the reservation a little, you should, you know, the editor should reel them in if they go to the comment section. That's it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Hope you enjoyed it.